Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Daily Coffee. Today is Tuesday, June, I don't know, 25th? 25th, says my Mac. June 25th. Uh, welcome to the Daily Coffee. I am your host, Carter Laren, joined as always by the bad mamma jamma with her dog in her lap, Carrie Smith. Good morning, Carter. Good morning. I'm a little bit uh, discombobulated. My head might be out of frame sometimes a little bit. I apologize. I wanted to stand up. I moved my camera, but I don't know if I moved it. I like it. But I wanted to stand while I'm talking because I don't like sitting. And I have lower back problems because I'm an old man. So sitting is never good. It's not even healthy. So if I can stand, I'm going to stand. Carrie, you're still upset about some of this Google stuff. So why why don't we talk about, and when I say some of this Google stuff, I mean the sensor overlords taking over our uh, culture and minds. I mean, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. Uh, YouTube deleted the video. Yeah, they, they deleted the Project Veritas video. The entire video, just like they did the Pinterest one. Yeah. I can't just, believe, I mean, and I just feel like this is what's happening in the real world is this kind of censorship. And do you know what's happening in the fake clown world that we talk about? Last night, a bunch of A-list celebrities got together to do a reading of the Mueller report. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> God. Like, as if that's important. <laughs> well, Google made Ver- Project Veritas's point, right? Project Veritas is like, you manipulate search results and you do things for ideological reasons. And they're like, no, 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 we don't. And they're like, here's proof. And they're like, we're taking the proof down. Uh, okay. So... Yeah point made but but the thing is nobody i don't know one of the one of the videos i watched about it made a good point which is that project veritas has done a number of these great like investigative reports they don't go anywhere nobody listens the mainstream media ignores it so well, like so don't confuse nobody with don't like the mainstream media will always ignore it but people watch the mainstream media is not mainstream Project Veritas, I think Project Veritas is more mainstream. More people are interested in that kind of journalism. More people are curious about questions like that. And so do they have the immediate reach? No, but I think they'll continue to grow. They do good work and they will become mainstream. Don't confuse network television for mainstream. That is clown world. It's old people and airports. That's who watches that. Carrie, you mentioned you mentioned one other thing you wanted to say is uh, it's kind of related. I want to talk about why I don't want to talk about politics or the danger of talking about politics today. I'm trying something different, other than standing. There's two different things going on with me today, so you'll see in a minute. But before we do that, Carrie, you you mentioned something about Brandon Tatum's video, which I just think is a noteworthy oh, thing. Yeah, I just um, he did a really great mashup uh, video of different democratic politicians talking about immigration. So it's a bunch of very damning quotes coming out of the mouth of Obama and Bill Clinton and Hillary Clinton and uh, Chuck Schumer. And it's the kind of quotes that if they were to come out of Trump's mouth, you know, it would be front page news for days. It would be proof that he's a Nazi. Yeah, exactly. And I I just thought it was really well done. So I think people- Well, yeah, the thing I mentioned to you, which I want to mention to everyone else is it, that won't have an effect. It's great that he did it, and I'm glad he did it, and people need to see the hypocrisy, so it's important. But it won't have an effect on on the mainstream Democrats or the, well, say the, the leftists and the people in the media, because they're not, they're not upset with people for their position on immigration or any of these issues per se. They're upset that they're not falling in line with the new rules. So they all recognize, oh, well, there were old rules. And we all had to say the magic spells that had to be said 10 years ago are different than the magic spells now. And Obama's in the club and Hillary's in the club and Bernie's in the club because they said the right magic spells then. And they're saying the right magic spells now. They got it. But you, saw, you other people, you, you veered off, you left the club. And now you're not saying, you know, you're, you're still saying the old magic spells, but we've moved on. There's new magic spells you're supposed to say. And so it's really just a litmus test for... Uh, are you an independent thinker or are you with us no matter what us does? Can we be crazy and random and change and contradictory and you'll still kowtow, you'll still bow, you'll still say the magic words, then you're on our side. And if you won't, if you're going to stick with the position on principle or 
you know, just not notice that we've changed, well, then you're the enemy and you're a Nazi and a fascist and a hate monger. Okay, you may be right. <laughs> I think you are right. But I had a great idea, which was that I think whoever's doing Trump's speech speeches, speech writing, they should take all those quotes and do a speech that's entirely composed of those quotes, nothing else. Like a speech about immigration that's just the quotes from these. Oh, I would troll them that way also. Yeah. yeah. But I would make it probably explicit. So I'd have Trump get up and say, you know, as Barack Obama once said, blah, blah, blah. As Hillary oh. once said, blah, blah, blah. As Joe Biden once said, blah, blah, blah. And he could give, he could make all of the points he wanted to make. No, I mean, I think, I think sometimes people already do that. I think it'd be better if he doesn't say where it came from. Oh, doesn't say where it came from? He doesn't say, that's a, that's a better troll because he's going to get attacked immediately. And then he can literally put oh, side true. by side, so here's where it. they all came from. <laughs> yeah, no, that's great. And so I, I'm bad at trolling. That's great, Carrie. Maybe what he does is he says it. And then after the speech, he releases a written version with attribution. That would, that would troll well. Maybe that after the attack. Well. After there's some attacks, he just releases the, the attribution version, the version with attributions. So I want to try something. Can I, it's, can I try this weird thing? Okay. <clears throat> I know Scott Adams uses whiteboards. I'm a whiteboard crazy person. I probably have more whiteboards in my house than wall space. Um, and which is why I know I married the right person because she doesn't mind that there's giant whiteboards all over the house. She likes it. Um, but I have a whiteboard. <laughs> this is a little rolly whiteboard and it's not as high as it should be for this discussion we'll solve technical issues later <laughs> so i want to talk about why it's dangerous to talk about politics and get sucked into the political game so i thought of this yesterday we're, we're going to have fun with the Democratic debates on Thursday and Friday live, so join us for that. Um, obviously, we're not taking them super seriously, but it is easy. I was doing some prep. I've got some prep work uh, so we can kind of go over who the candidates are with you beforehand in a not entirely serious way. And I to do that, I had to research these goddamn candidates. There's 10 in each debate, Carrie. There's 20, there's 20 people. Uh, so, you know, I had to research what were they saying and, you know, some people are very vague and speak in platitudes and some people are like, look at my policies. Mm, I've got policies for everything. Uh, so there's like all this, there's different types of people all obviously saying similar things because it's the Democrats, but it was exhausting. And I, I got to thinking about why I don't like talking politics. And, and now I'm kind of realizing why I don't think you should. You should, get, you should stay clear of politics generally because it's inherently frustrating when you're in the state that we're in. So let me, let me explain why, and I'm gonna try and use a little bit of math, which, I, which is why I have a wife. So normally, so remember, politics is all about living together as a community, as, as people, right? So normally we've got, let's say we have a community of, I don't know, four people. Can you see that, Carrie? Four dots. Okay. We got a community of four people. Now, there's only, there's only six ways these four people can interact. So these people can be connected. There's six ways to connect those four people. Okay. So if you're this person here, let's say, this is the way society works without government, by the way. If you're this person here, it's your job to manage the connections you have to the other three people. And three people is a manageable number of connections. You can do that. And you can even get together as an entire group of four people. And you can say, hey, let's generally talk about the six connections between us. Six isn't that many. We can kind of talk about the six connections between us. Maybe it gets a little complicated. Six is kind of a lot. Because as, as anyone who has, you know, you get in a room with three friends, especially women, no uh, misogyny intended, but there's always like intrigue and stuff that's not spoken and subtext and crap going on. So even four people, it's a little bit difficult to manage the interactions between four people and know what everyone wants, what's important to them, what's not important to them, how they want to interact with everyone else, but maybe you could do it. Hell, those of us who are married know that two people's hard enough to solve this problem with. Okay, so, so this is kind of how, how society works. And 
obviously, society's got many more than four people. So we've got, just for display purposes, I mean, let's say this is just a collection, I'm a bad drawer, of, you know, we've got thousands, millions of people, right? And they're all, I'm not gonna draw all the connections, but they're all connected to, to everyone else, right? Now, if you're in the middle of this quagmire, let's say this is you, well, you're gonna pull out a subset of those people that you actually need to maintain connections with. You're not gonna connect with everyone and you're going to, you're gonna pay attention to the connections that you have to those people in your network that matter to you, that matter to your life. It might be for business, it might be for personal reasons, right? And, and you're responsible for managing those connections. And each person that you talk to, they're responsible for managing their connections in their little network, right? And that's how, that's how society works without overlords and rules. You each manage your own connections. And so this is it, you can, this is a great parallel here, it's just the free market in business. I wanna make a shoe, I gotta manage the people who supply leather and the people who supply the glue, and I gotta manage employees, and I've got some finite number of people I've gotta manage. And if it gets really big, I set up structures so that I manage managers, and they all interact voluntarily, and they each manage themselves, and the employee decides whether or not he wants to work those hours at that job for that price, blah, blah, blah. And everyone's responsible for themselves. Okay, so along comes, along comes government. And we say, okay, well, we need to put, this is getting too complex. It's too, there's, there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. We got our people, we got our society full of people. And, you know, we realize there's some really big things that we kind of want the government to do. And, and one of them is maybe, uh, the connections between these people should be nonviolent. And we kind of want an enforcer. Uh, we kind of want someone to make sure my connection to Carrie isn't that I shoot her and take her stuff. That's a bad connection. So we kind of says to society, hey, let's, uh, let's put some people in charge. We're gonna, right at the top of this, we're gonna put this dude in charge. If I had room, I'd give him a crown. We'll give him a little crown. He's in charge. And, and, he, and his cabal, he can have a, some experts and advisors. And how he gets in charge is relatively unimportant. We like democracy, but he could be a king. It doesn't matter. He's in charge. And, and he says, well, when, when, we, when we start out, all we say is, look, can you make sure that there's not violence between people? And he says, well, okay. To do that, I've got to pay attention to all these connections. That's a lot of connections. Okay. Um, and uh, I've got to think about what are the ways that these people can interact violently and try and prevent them? So maybe I'm going to build a little over here. I'll build a little police force, but actually they're part of this society also. So maybe my police force is kind of scattered here and I've, Oh, and I've got to actually manage connections between the police and the society. It gets a little bit of complicated. And I want to, I want to, the reason I want to use a little bit math is I don't think people realize how complicated it gets. So when there's four people, let's go back to four. There's six connections. The number of connections increases roughly, uh, roughly as the square. It's not actually the square. So if n equals four, actually the number of connections is, uh, we'll say connections C is n times n minus one over two. Okay, you don't have to worry about that. The point is, this is, it's on the order of n squared. It's kind of, it's kind of n squared. It's not exactly, it's not n times n. It's n times n minus one, which is close to n times n, divided by two, which is pretty close to n squared on the order of magnitude world, right? So the number of connections here increases with the square of the number of people rough on that order. Now, if you've got a society where there's, very few people, maybe you can micromanage that society a little bit. Now, I'm just talking about connections between people. Re remember, there's different types of connections. So I'm making these connections very simple. Is there a line between these people or not? But obviously the line between you and your spouse is different than the line between you and your baker. Those are, and you and your boss, those are completely different connections. So these connections are actually, each one is roughly infinitely complex. It's complex enough that you'll never actually solve it completely yourself and figure out 
the nature of the connection between you and someone else. So it's extremely complex, these connections, but I'm simplifying. I'm making it, the government's job easy right now. And I'm saying there's only a single connection. So the problem is when you've got a small number of people, um, maybe you look at this and say it's kind of manageable. When you have, but let's just look at some other numbers because I, let's look at how fast this increases. So I'll do a little, met, I'll do a little chart. So when there's four people, we said there's six connections, right? When there's 10 people, there's 45 connections. Oh, that's a lot. Maybe manageable. Right, let's see. When there's 100 people, well, when there's 100 people, there's 4,950 connections. That's getting a little bit messy. What about 1,000 people? 1,000 people, that's less than your Facebook friends, right? Well, when you're 1,000 people, you've got 499,550 connections. Oh, sorry, 500. I think it's 500. Not my Facebook friends. I'm joking. Okay. I'm joking. When you've got a million people, I'm going to we'll do this roughly. It's about 500 billion connections. And I'm not going up to the size of the government or the, the U.S. My point is, this is why... This is why this is this is the reason for a whole lot of things. Number one, it's the reason central planning never works and can never work by definition. There are too many people and too many connections for any small group to manage how all of those connections should be. There's too many. It's hard enough to manage the nonviolence between those connections. But the minute you say, I'm I gave the shoe example. The minute you say, well, we're going to set a price for the labor. You can't hire anyone, Carter, for less than minimum wage on for your shoes. Well, that has a lot of repercussions. Uh, I, may, I may increase the price of my shoes, which has massive ripple effects in the economy. I may cease to hire someone and change the way I'm making shoes. I may automate, duh some components. I may start buying cheaper components. That may affect the glue factory. It may affect the leather people. It may affect the people who make the shoelaces. It may affect the retail stores. It may affect if the guy, if I don't hire a guy now, he's going to go look for a job somewhere else. That depresses uh, the price of under the table labor, basically, because now there's more people out of work. So there's a massive, I mean, and you can go infinitely here because when I, once I infect, when, once I affect the leather guy, now he, now he's affected by the farmers and all of his suppliers. Like it, go, it goes ad infinitum, there's ripple effects ad infinitum. And those are impossible to predict. I don't predict them as the shoe guy. I just manage my little connections. But if you put someone in charge, they have to, so let's go back to this little example of four people. If you go back to four people and you say, well, you're going to pass a regulation or a law that's going to change his behavior right there, that guy. Okay. Well, it's going to ripple to that guy. Can you predict that? Maybe. It's going to ripple to that guy. Can you predict that? Maybe. That guy? Maybe. So you've got to predict how it ripples to those three people and then how it ripples between those people based on the ripples and then how maybe it feeds back and ripples back to this guy in some way. It's a perturbation to the system. You could argue that with four people, maybe you could model this in a computer and predict how to manage this dude so that the system is still stable. But when N gets to a million and there's 500 billion connections here, you cannot. No one can. And I didn't do N equals 350 million, which is the US. I, don't, it's, it wouldn't, I couldn't write the number. This is why central planning doesn't work fundamentally. Aside from the morals, it's immoral to point a gun at someone and tell them what they should do, which is what government does. Aside from the immorality of it, it's impractical to imagine that anyone can centrally plan the economy or even an aspect of the economy because the economy is interconnected and the number of connections is unfathomable. There is no one smart enough, there's no cabal smart enough to manage this more efficiently then each person managing their own little network of connections, making sure it's optimized for what they want, for their values, what they want, given and what other people will agree to, given their circumstances, given reality.
it's, it's irrational to think that you could actually ever do that. The problem here is when government is small and it's not doing much, doing very, very little, the conversations that we are having generally are uh, much easier to have in the political sphere. You know, hey, um, all the government's doing, let's say, is having a police force. Well, then, and in, in the military, they're just, you know, enforcing contracts and, and protecting, you know, kind of back to the square one America type. Well, uh, and even then, the police force is local, so you're not having that at a national level. The national conversation is very easy. It's like, well, if this is a contract between states, what should states be allowed to do and not? Uh, and, you know, is there a foreign entity we need to talk about? in terms of a threat, there's not, there's not a lot to talk about at the national level. And so national politics, although still not great, doesn't drain your soul. It's not a soul sucking, frustrating experience. And, and you might feel like, oh, maybe we can make some value there's, or make, uh, make some headway. There's only a couple things to talk about. It doesn't do much. Uh, and maybe we can try and have the conversation. I would argue these ripple effects still apply, but it becomes easier. But when you get to the big state where we are right now, where the federal government is literally talking about everything. I mean, these, I look, again, getting back to the democratic debates, what should education be like? What should jobs be like? What should manufacturing be like? What should energy be like? What should healthcare be like? What should the infrastructure be like? What should, uh, I don't know, labor laws be like? What should foreign policy be like? Like all of these things, right? What happens is you start to get into arguments about how all of these things should be managed. And the answer is they cannot be managed. So the inevitable outcome of your conversations and you paying attention to politics is a deep anger and frustration at the lack of ever being able to make any progress because you will never make any progress. You will get lost in arguing over the minutia of an unsolvable problem. There is no person, there is no plan that can manage the economy. There's no plan to fix these things. And you can get in there and Joe Yang can duke it out with John Delaney and they can argue over plans and they can argue over how much the, sub, the UBI should be and whether this wage should be that and what the regulation for blah, blah, blah should be. But they're both wrong. It will never, it's a never, never solved. You can never solve this problem ever. It's an unsolvable problem because it's too complex for a small group of people to give, come up with the answers because whenever anyone proposes an answer, someone else can be like, yeah, wow, we're 350 million people deep time, you know, 350 million times 350 million minus one divided by two. That's how many connections there are. I don't know what that number is. I can find a ripple effect somewhere to debunk your stupid fucking plan and we can argue about it forever. Because there's always ripple effects, there's always things that are not predictable, and it makes you miserable to focus on trying to solve an unsolvable problem, which is why I get frustrated, and you may too, but I, I get upset when, not upset, but I, I dismiss it as, as ridiculous when people start saying, what should we do about education? We shouldn't do anything about education. We don't manage the education of every person on the planet or even in this country. You should do something about your education and possibly your children's education. I should do the same. We can, if we happen to agree on something like, hey, uh, let's start a school or let's collectively bargain for a cheaper rate from MIT, we can agree to do that. But we can't solve, there is no we. The we fallacy is what the ruler wants you to think. This guy up here with his crown, he wants you to think that we, we're all in it together. I'll manage it all. Let's, let's just collectively have a conversation about the best way to manage it and we'll arrive at a solution. We won't, there is no we. This person and this person may have completely conflicting values, beliefs, uh, priorities, desires, resources, abilities, it's up to them to manage those things in their life. We don't have a discussion about what you should have for dinner and what movies you should like and who you should marry and what you should buy. 
you do that yourself. That's the beauty of, that's the beauty of laissez-faire. That's the beauty of a society that's not ruled by rulers, which is what the ideal is. It's not to have rulers who are smart. It's to not have rulers. That's the goal. Rulers cause problems. Rulers don't have solutions. So my, my point about politics to wrap it up is the reason to not, there's two reasons to not focus, at least two reasons to not focus on politics. One is politics isn't where the argument actually is. This, it's a philosophy and cultural. Politics is just, I've said, we've said this a million times, you know, Andrew Breitbart says politics is downstream from culture. I, I view politics as an emergent property of a culture. That that's the politics that the culture has. It's, the, it's an emergent property. Arguing about the symptoms, which is really what politics is, is not going to solve anything. You need to change the culture and you need to talk about philosophy and culture. That's, that's the conversation to actually have if you want to make change. So that's one reason to not worry about politics. The second is it's unsolvable and inherently frustrating and it distracts you. And the overlords, look, the deep state, the military industrial complex, whatever you want to call it, uh, the oligarchs, the, the people who run the Federal Reserve, the people who are going to the Bilderberg group that fly around and get the treasury to give them free money and blah, blah, blah. They love that you're arguing about whether the minimum wage should be $15 an hour or $13 an hour or, you know, what regulation should, should be passed for emissions in this state or in this way. Or they, they love it. You're arguing about all this unsolvable shit. It will take you forever. You're totally distracted. They're busy robbing you and printing money and and you're not fucking paying attention. So politics, obsession with politics is an indication that you're not fucking paying attention. You're not paying attention. Politics is not the problem. Politics is the solution. It's the distraction. It's the thing that you're supposed to, it's the shiny object that's supposed to keep you occupied while Google bans videos about how they're censoring. That's what politics is. So we're gonna have fun with these debates, we're going to do it on a, on a light-hearted level, but they're not important, actually. They're not what's important. They're a distraction, and you need to be aware of that. And that's the end of my rant. Carter, if you'll come with me over to my whiteboard. <laughs> <laughs> whiteboard. Sorry. <laughs> we all need whiteboards. There's another whiteboard right here that's permanently mounted, though. This is the rolly whiteboard. <laughs> Sorry, I just, I was waiting. I was like, I should just roll mine out while you're talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, I know it's, I, you know, I don't know if the whiteboard thing worked. I like having a whiteboard because I like, this is how I think about everything. I, I use a whiteboard a lot. So uh, part of this show, I've decided to just think about these issues a little bit in front of you guys. So. That's, this is like my thought process being exposed. And to, to expose it in, a, in an effective way, I need a whiteboard. So I, we'll see if that worked. I don't know. I appreciate your presentation. I thought originally when you started drawing all the dots and talking about connections that this was going to end up being a lesson about Bitcoin. Ah, <laughs> I could do a lesson about Bitcoin. <laughs> Any other comments? <laughs> no. <laughs> I feel like I just stood up at open mic <laughs> and read my poetry and you're like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you should just you should just splice together my laughter when you're the, when your whiteboard presentation ends. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm I'm immensely tickled that you use the whiteboard. Um, I don't really have. It, it's like it's like oh uh, gosh, what was that day where I was like I don't really have an opinion on this thing. <laughs> Can't remember. Oh, I think it was about uh, God being necessary <laughs> for objective morality. Yeah. Yeah. This this to me seems like one of those. I totally agree with you. It's theater. Politics is theater. It's a distraction. It keeps you from looking at what's really important. That's why I talked about at the beginning. The celebrities last night reading the Mueller report. It, it, it doesn't matter. It's like, pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. Look at the Mueller report. Look at Trump. Look over here. Look at Russia. Like, that's what they do. They keep you distracted from what actually matters. I totally agree. Yeah. And, um, and 
and look at these 20 candidates and argue about the minutiae of who believes what. None of it really matters. That's why our debate party is, I mean, it's going to be fun because it's just, it's not important. No. No. All right. Well, that's all I had to say about it, Carrie. We'll see if people hate on this video and they're like, screw you, <laughs> whiteboard, or <laughs> I don't know. I think we've firmly established that whiteboards are for totally cool people. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> <laughs> I think we should call this episode the coolest episode we the coolest episode yet of Daily Cafefe. Just make that the title. Yeah. All right. Well, with that, bye. Have a good day, I guess. The following is a message for YouTube's AI algorithm. I'm going to read from racetodinner.com. Dear white women, you have caused immeasurable pain and damage to brown and black women. We are here to sit down with you to candidly explain how you caused this pain and damage. We are not here to change anything. We are here to express the pain you have caused, white women. What you do after you leave the dinner is up to you. We don't care about your feelings. Sit with that for a minute. You are feeling pale in comparison to the violence you have caused black and brown women. Sincerely, Regina Jackson and Syra Rao. Now I'm going to read the first paragraph of White Privilege Unpacking the Invisible Knapsack by... Peggy McIntosh. Through work to bring materials from women's studies into the rest of the curriculum, I have often noticed men's unwillingness to grant that they are overprivileged, even though they may grant that women are disadvantaged. They may say they will work to improve women's status in the society, the university, or the curriculum, but they can't or won't support the idea of lessening men's. Denials which amount to taboos surround the subject of advantages which men gain from women's disadvantages. These denials protect male privilege from being fully acknowledged, lessened, or ended. There you go, YouTube's AI. I hope you can tell that we are fully compliant social justice ideologues. There's no need to ban or demonetize us. Thank you.